Okay then, welcome everybody again. Uh, thanks for having us, first of all. Uh, we'll see if we'll get another chance after this thing here. Um, you see the red BSH Workshops logo, that's a cooperative that Steve's gonna, gonna talk, talk about in a minute. minute. I want to start off with um, making the clicker work. Hit a spice bar. What else? We got another Our Giants of Female slide for you. Lynn Conway, a computer scientist, um, worked at IBM in the 1960s. She was instrumental in doing stuff to improve performance uh, in microchip design. Go and read up on her if that's interesting to you. Uh, the thing that caught me really is that she is a transgender person. So the statement that you can read here, first, she was breaking gender barriers in the computer science field because she um, was a woman, right? She was female. So we all know which kinds of battles she probably had to fight. And then imagine doing the same thing again over when she came out as being transgender, being forced basically to come out and probably fighting the same fight all over again for being a transgender person. So kudos to her for doing that and at the same time excelling at being a scientist and doing stuff that we can use these days. I know it works. So, driven development. So, uh, yeah, we've, we've been batting forward why we do certain ways of programming. So this is gonna be going through that story. Uh -huh. So who are we? Uh, DSH stands for Delacour SSDC and Hamport Software Engineering, the companies of us. Uh, we decided we weren't old enough, so we brought Brian in. <laughs> and he brought more than 90 years of combined real life experience. <laughs> so that was handy. <laughs> um, I think I've improved that joke. <laughs> Unlike you. <laughs> um, so all of us, we do different types of work. We do, uh, in Europe it's much more common to do fixed price work, so we tend to do fixed price jobs. But there's also mentoring training. I'm, I'm a kind of straightforward fixed price, ask me to build something, I build something. You do more mentoring and training and support type stuff. Fabiola doesn't do anything because they're a core. Don't, we don't talk about that yet. Um, and Brian does, all the really clever stuff around LabVIEW because he knows all the units. <laughs> so I, in 2002, we recognized that uh, if you treat LabVIEW like a proper language, software language, you could get some benefits from it. So we wrote a book about that. Um, I don't suggest you buy it because it's quite old now. Well, 2002. <laughs> It is a good book. It's a, I can give you a free copy if you want one. I, I, there's a, some, some clever person made a PDF. I, I do that. Don't give Pearson any money. They're, they're crap. Um, so yeah, I've been, I've been writing industrial software since pretty much I left school at 16. That's no, 17. Um, so in factories. Lab use since 1996 and been doing fixed price projects since 1999. So I've got a wealth of experience. I've got about three or four, about 300 projects behind me. Uh, got little badges here. Um, probably the interesting one is the center of excellence. Um, just talk to us about that if you want to bring your whole team up. Same with Jörg. Actually, he's probably better to talk about it because you'll get more sensible answers from him than you will me. Uh, I'm really interested in design, software design. Um, I'm very interested in sort of process. I'm very interested in taking this complex thing we do and making it simple, which is surprisingly difficult. And I'm getting very interested in psychology and uh, how us programmers turn the mush in our brain into things that work. Uh, so that kind of thing is very interesting to me. Yeah, that's me. And now that Fab has taken a step back for the time being, I'm probably lowering the age average by 89 years, approximately. These two old geezers. I have been doing software for a surprisingly long time, actually. It dates me a bit, 23 years, uh, doing lab work since 2007. I'm an Austrian, actually, living in Germany. Um, 
We were the first NI Center of Excellence in Germany. Thanks, uh, Nancy, again for that. I am very proud of that, actually. And as it says, you talk to me about working in small teams. That's what we do. Uh, I have a, a small consultancy company with, with six people, and we integrate with uh, our customers, help them get things done. As Steve said, we're usually working in fixed price scenarios uh, because that's the thing in Europe, really. Uh, some accountant needs something where you can put a, like a tick in the checkbox. So we do fixed price. Fixed price. I am a sucker for process and workflow standardization and automation. That's what I like to talk about the most, actually. And I like open source. I like applying open source principles to our customer projects, which some people would call inner source. And yeah, number of badges here. I want to point out the DQMH Trusted Advisor and DQMH Consortium badges. So if you have any questions about DQMH and Fab is not around, you can take the second best option and talk to me. Here's the best option. Depends, I would say. So, uh, are you going? <laughs> Go for it. Okay, so the DSH mantra is we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Anybody into Agile, maybe? Anybody? Yes, right? it's Agile, very professional. <laughs> Good answer. So, I guess because it doesn't say XP or Scrum, nobody came to it, but this is the original idea, the original thought, I dare say, I claim behind Agile working. And it's just common sense, right? And this is what we want to do. This is what we do in our daily lives. This is what DSH is all about. But there's a caveat. So it used to be the three of us, Fab, Steve, and me. Uh, Brian joining didn't make it easier, I guess. Uh, there are some things that we agree. Those are probably the fundamentals, and those are potentially the things that are more universally applicable. But then there's lots of things we don't agree. That's usually the implementation, maybe the con context-sensitive thing that depends on your situation. So for any of you who joined the workshop recently, you know what I'm talking about, I guess. Ah, ah, what are you doing? You're giving it all away. Oh, yeah, go away. So I wasn't present, I'm honest. I apologize for the old man. You don't have to look at the rest of the slides now. We can finish early. So, we wanted to talk about mm -hmm, driven development or design today. There's a lot of that out there, so I thought we'd start with the textbook definition. I did some research, actually, scientific research. I went to websites and looked it up. And we can see that there's a, a theme to all of that. What does driven mean? propelled or motivated by something, caused or influenced by something or someone, controlled or propelled by something specified used in combination, like something dash driven. Um, I had norm in mind, actually, when I looked these things up. Is it driven? Is it designed for? That's semantics, probably. Um, so either way, it means that something is there that, that makes us do whatever we do, right? Thinking about software, what, what's driving us when doing software? And I don't mean like the boss or sending the invoice, but I mean, if you just take a step back and think about when I'm writing software, what, why, why do I do that? Why do I sit down, open a computer and write a program? We want to implement something, right? I mean, that's the reason. Maybe sometimes we want to have fun, try out something, but usually it's to get something done, a feature. In a project business, you might call that the scope. The next... Um, Impediment <laughs> that is put upon us is a schedule. Chances are somebody wants to have that by some time, right? So there's a timeline, uh, a milestone, production waits for it, whatever. So we want to implement a feature by some time. Next thing that comes up is quality. We want it to be bug free, should run stable, uh, usable, maybe even reusable. So there are all sorts of things that I guess we'll be talking about now for three days, how to make that easier, how to make it better, et cetera, et cetera. So it is not enough to get the thing done and deliver it by some point in time. No, we want to make it a good thing. So features, schedule, and quality. And that would be cool, right? There wouldn't be a problem there yet, but cost comes in. Because I guess, I guess everybody has been in a situation where not all of those four were just available in abundance. And you had to compromise maybe on something. And before I get to that, 
Before we were driven, we were something else. We were oriented or based or focused. So if you like go search for different methodologies, you'll find all sorts of stuff and think about object oriented. Maybe if it was invented today, it would be called object driven. I don't know. So, but these things are interchangeable, I think. So it's not, the semantics are not that important, I would say. So who has seen this before? Some people, okay, what is it called? It goes by many names, project management triangle and other things. The idea being that these um, properties of that software project that we're talking about, they are connected in some way. So you cannot change a single one without affecting the whole system, without like changing another one too. That's not how like the physical representation would work, right? So imagine we need to expand the schedule or maybe the other way around, sorry. We want to lower the cost. Still, we want the same quality. That could mean that we need more time, like less resources on it, only one program instead of two or whatever the, the thing is. So these are connected. We can't change one without something giving. Uh, we could lower the quality, of course. So we could say less cost, faster delivery, suck up the quality. We talked about that yesterday a lot. Um, most people think that's not a good idea. But then again, most people live in reality and sometimes this is just what happens, right? So suffice it to say, these things are connected. You can't just go and change one without affecting the other. Then I went and did some more research scientifically again by going to Wikipedia, reading up what they have to say about these terms. And I wanna read it, design, because we're talking about something driven design or development, right? Design is all the activity involved in conceptualizing, framing, implementing, commissioning, and ultimately modifying the software, or more specifically, the activity following requirement specification and before programming as in a stylized software engineering process. Who has ever thought about that when they thought about design? I didn't. So Steve, what is your definition of design? Oh, that's exactly that, I wrote the article. <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say the, the, that's quite an old fashioned one because it's following requirements and before programming, I think for a language like LandView, you're designing as, as you go as much as people don't want you to do that, but there is an element of that and that's the advantage. So I would say it would go all the way to the end. I think the top statement is actually ultimately modifying. That's probably where they should have finished. <laughs> so. so it usually involves problem solving, planning a software solution. I think that's fair. It does say here it includes both a low-level component and algorithm design and a high-level architecture design. So you might be thinking about the API of your class. You might be thinking about uh, the UI of the application. So there are different variations on design there, I would say. Same goes for development. Again, the process of conceiving, specifying, designing, programming, documenting, testing, and bug fixing, involving creating and maintaining applications, frameworks, or other software components. Uh, that's a... Uh, you're almost speaking as fast as me. Yeah, I'm working on that. Uh, because, I mean, it's always the same. I always have like half an hour for three hours of content. So anyhow, typically in a planned and structured process, often overlapping with software engineering, yada, yada, yada. So design has a very nice definition. Development has a very nice definition. We think that for simplicity, we are going to use design and development interchangeably. Talking about both, more or less, most of the times in these slides. And uh, looking at the watch, I see that we only have 20 minutes left. So I think we're gonna go fast on some of the slides uh, because as you can see, uh, we won't be able to cover all of those, right? And in my personal opinion, not all of those are very interesting to talk about anyhow. Other people might have a different opinion, of course. So- They're not up here. <laughs> they're not up here. There's lots of these different methodologies, right? Uh, and I guess, for any letter that you can find in the alphabet, you can make up three by your own. Uh, take any word and say driven design, and that's a thing. Uh, some of those, of course, have more uh, traction or more like a more popular. Uh, TDD, of course, that's the jam for everybody. We want to do TDD behavior. That's um, not as popular as TDD, but still well known. Why don't we get through the slides and then we talk? Okay. So let's talk about TDD, or maybe not, because I think. Uh, let me see uh, hands, who does know, who has heard about TDD? 
Okay, that's nearly everybody. So DDD means test-driven development. And as opposed to just getting it done, test-driven development stands for thinking about how to test your software before you even write it. So the test-driven development or test-driven design, and there's much more to be said than I can say about it, uh, basically boils down to think about how to test it, potentially write the test first, then implement the software, run the test to see that it passes and you're good, right? Obviously, this has um, advantages to your design, probably, to your process. Um, you can imagine that if you write the test first, you're going to catch bugs early on, or if you make changes, you can have regression tests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, TDD is a very popular thing to do. Many people do it. Uh, again, show of hands, who is doing TDD? I thought that your hands would be the first up, Alan. Uh, Fab, of course. Where's Sam? Not here, but he would raise his hand. Okay, so I think we can just go past that because everybody more or less has an idea of what that is. Yeah, skip. And skip again. Ah, there's Sam. Uh, focus on feedback. I'm not sure why that comes after TDD, to be honest. We're still going. Let's come to the next bit. Okay, so. Don't worry. You go. Keep going. <laughs> It'll be right. You go. Um, so, yeah. TDD is an internal kind of process. It's to do with um, testing the units you've already decided to do. Um, I think for some organizations that ends up being a little bit dry and you have to actually then go off and do your agile stuff and actually see a customer and talk to them. Um, so, and it leads really, don't, don't try and get it right first time, you know, we'll get close, get feedback. You know, get the users and then act on it. So there's a there's a whole suite of other drivens that are trying to push an organisation into actually just getting some feedback. So all of these, and we're not, I'm not going to dwell on them. There's there's quite a good little uh, link there, um, but they're all like what I would call sort of feedback biased, feedback driven type things. Um, so each of these first four validation functionality of the code behind the user behavior. So yeah, it's focusing on the user, user behavior. Each of is strong in communication, blah, blah, I'm not going to read it out. Everyone can read it. Um, so by, yeah, it's just pushing the focus back. Okay. I'm pushing on because we like our slides. Um, again, there's, there's very um, described processes. Uh, and, and a lot we have to bear in mind, a lot of this is large textual based uh, languages that are, aren't rapid like LabVIEW. So the, these are kind of more important. You have to get this, a lot of this information fed back, back to you at, at the front because it has big implications. Domain, domain driven, I, uh, I read this and I laughed because it was, uh, what they're aiming to do is make a common language. And in making a common language, they made a domain-driven language, as far as I could tell. It was so specific to domain-driven design that it seemed very particular to me, which defeated the object. But so I didn't, I didn't dwell on domain-driven design very much apart from that one part. Model-driven development, going in from UML, again, they're trying to make the agile development process I'm going to hate myself for saying it, slightly less agile, <laughs> with a bit more planning up front and a bit more modeling up front. Go off, do software, do a bit of modeling. Uh, which is addressing an issue with agile is that uh, it can be used as an excuse just to write a load of software without doing much work uh, up front. And again, both of these type of methods are plugged into it. So if you look at the massive map of things you can do with agile that make it less agile, these are some of them. Um, and again, as you can tell by my term, I'm not particularly bought into all these methods. It's probably much more important if you've got a large team and you all want to go in the same direction together. Uh, I didn't mind the agile model driven development. I thought that was actually quite a good one. But get into ones that I like now. Uh, pain driven development. I like this one. This is, this is, uh, I would say how, how I develop. <laughs> and I like it because it's feeding back. Uh, I don't like pain, I don't like stress. Uh, I spend an awful lot of time 
putting effort in so I don't have pain and stress in my process. Um, so yeah, I quite like that one. It's one people should consider uh, in their processes. Defensive programming is very good. Uh, changing your designs and processes and methods to reduce that pain is also good. Oh, look at it. Well, I don't like this. You could like that. Uh, I'm gonna go back to the old fashioned way. Duke. Duke. This one I don't like. So, I know I've seen it many times, hiding source code because you think you're gonna be judged. Uh, Non-delivery, deliberate, slow walking eyes. I've had a couple of jobs that I've gone in and they haven't even taken the hardware out of the box after, well, after the point in time that the management get me in to rescue the job. <laughs> uh, um, and a lot of that, the background is that they don't want to be found out, you know, so there's a lot of fear in that. Uh, yeah, complexity propaganda is so you go in and people go, oh, software is really hard. And, and if you ever do software for a mechanical engineering company, for example, it's, it's this baffling, opaque thing that only software engineers know. So all engineering process doesn't apply to it. I, I don't understand. So and fear of changing anything. So again, going back to sort of test-driven design, one of the ways of alleviating that fear is having a suite of tests that you can run. Uh, and so the thing I always say is, is knowledge is the cure. You know, it's, it's, you sit down and you understand what's going on. It's, uh, ooh, you're doing it, right? cool. So why do it? Insecurity. Uh, bad management. I like the term healthy and unhealthy ego. Uh, a good manager has a team that has a healthy ego. I don't, I don't believe in ego less. I think, I think we should have an ego. I think ego is a good thing. Uh, but your ego should be able to cope with things like somebody saying that they don't like your design. <laughs> you know, cope with that. It's, it's the learning process. Um, and generally it's lack of understanding. Again, it's the assumption that this software process is magic, done the way incredibly magic people and if you listen to me <laughs> I'm very uneducated and I managed to do it so I think everyone this is the most evil of all resume driven development I, I say it's that although um, I did have a uh, arrangement with my last permanent employee that they pay me a low wage if I could just go and mess around with different types of software design <laughs> so as long as you're up front and you talk to people I, I suppose it's not that evil but uh, essentially, you can tell if there's an inappropriate architecture, you know, if you go in and see a job and this has got a really complex architecture and somebody goes, oh yeah, I was trying to learn it. Well, you're learning it at somebody else's cost, you know, i.e. I, the person who's paying you. Um, high risk decision making, lack of uniformity again, every job has to be different because I'm learning something. Yeah. Not designing for support because bigger and better things await. That's also the other thing. Is because you're doing being uh, resume driven, you're actually not planning on staying in that company. <laughs> so who cares about support? <laughs> well, I'm off. <laughs> so yeah, there's things to look out for. There's uh, in there. Nice. Oh, there you go. I just told that. Oh, why do it? No, no, no. I've still got low pay. Look. Um, there's a reason people want to go out and fill their res resume up and go and get a better job. <laughs> it's, yeah, think about paying your employees more. Maybe, uh, maybe they'll stay a bit longer. Um, misalignment of company and employee ambitions is quite good, actually. That's like was better than my third. <laughs> Empathy driven development. So uh, we talked about Andrea Ulay, and there's a long list there. I agree with some of them. Uh, as you can tell, I'm European, so I don't agree with all of them. Empathy's. I don't know. But anyway, you can summarize it. <laughs> um, and funnily enough, I, I could have worn my, there's a, there's a company you can buy clothes from in, uh, uh, in England called Heb, Heb Troco, and they're uh, washing label when she says that on it. So <laughs> I think it's so funny. But that, don't be a dick thing, is. Um, it's quite central to a lot of uh, English sporting. So the cricket team actually have that as part of their, their mantra. And it's very important when they, they bring people into the team because they have such a problem with their best players being sociopaths 
and destroying the team. That that actually it became the mantra is that yeah, you want to be a England cricketer, for example, you've got to be a nice person, and it's made a difference. So anyway, yeah, don't be a dick. Now it gets interesting for me because that's uh, our jam, really. Deepak driven development. The, we came up with the term, I don't know, maybe two years ago when we were discussing DSH stuff. And thinking about, we do have a way of working. We do have a process, really a well-defined one, I think, uh, but it's not, it didn't really align with any of the popular methodologies. So we were going back and forth and figuring out, okay, what is driving us? And this is what we arrived at, at least for, for my team, for my company, for HSE. And humans make assumptions and are biased, and only because you can't imagine the code could be wrong, that doesn't mean that it isn't, right? It is sometimes, for whatever reason. And the more debugging information you have available, the higher the probability you won't search in the wrong places. That's, again, like the Agile Manifesto, that's common sense, really. So for us, it's... Uh, really a priority that we built into our projects, into our templates, the things we do, the way we do them, that we are able to, to pin down the source of any thing that should not be happening as fast as possible. So we can move forward, fix the thing and then get the work done. And maybe that's coming from the fact that we are doing lots of project work uh, where we have to go on site, maybe work with machines or other things that we didn't have access to before. And we need to be very swift in making it work. Some, sometimes, not all the time, production is stopped so we can do our stuff. Uh, the production manager is breathing down your neck. And uh, if something doesn't work, you, you just have to figure out very quickly what is the problem. Many times it's not like directly in our software. Sometimes it's timing, sometimes it's the electrical wiring, sometimes it's the PLC that's acting up or whatever. So this is our living reality a uh, lot of the times and my life is just easier when I can solve that problem very quickly, looking good to the customer, solving problems, etc. So that's really a nice place to be in, uh, little pain, no fear. That's what we like, right? So unexpected modifications, commissioning, after commissioning it's support when they say bugs in production or even rest commissions potentially, where we are brought in to fix something that we didn't even create. So what do we do then? We need to familiarize ourselves with the project. I don't know, look at the source code, put some probes, maybe even add some logging here or open up the API tester there. So this is our living reality. So this is what is actually driving our design. And that's different for other people, right? That's context sensitive. Uh, other people have other main driving factors, of course. So. I want to say it shows the biggest benefit for us when it's applied to the whole application. And that's something that I also realized yesterday in my discussions uh, with Sam. There are different aspects of your project, your program, your application to look at. Uh, it's not the same thing when you're developing the API of your hardware abstraction layer or when you're creating a template for your project that allows you to move forward quickly when you're creating a new application. So the, the debug driven development that I have in mind talks about the whole application, getting something to work. I don't think so much about developing, developing the APIs of the single modules maybe. So there's that. We need context for the debugging, that's for sure. Think about a log file. Uh, if the customer can tell you at what time something uh, happened, you can go look at the log file, you can see, okay, what were the last 10 log messages, uh, what happened during the last half minute or half hour, or whatever it is. So that's helpful. And it overlaps a lot with other better practices. Uh, if you think about the source code, what makes it easy to debug, if you find things, if you can identify things, and that means the naming of variables, having clean code that is modular so you can like drill down into the thing, which leads to encapsulation and the coupling and cohesion stuff, etc. So all of these things really are tied together and then tied into this. And it benefits from tooling, of course. So, uh, Norm, I think you'll talk again about these things tomorrow. Oh, yes. Uh, very good. Uh, there are two types of things uh, in your presentation. And the more tools you have available, the better you'll be equipped to get the job done, right? And log windows, API testers for DKMH, et cetera, et cetera. This one I want to highlight. 
Uh, and it will, it will appear on another slide at the end again. I think this holds true for anything we do, really. I can't think of any other example that wouldn't hold true. Do not think that focusing on debugging lets you get away with the lack of good practices. So the point of saying it's debug driven is not to say screw all the testing, screw all the design, all that doesn't matter because we'll have the debugging done in a, in a, in a, in a jiffy. That's not what I mean when I say that our design is debug driven. We need all the other things so we can have good debugging. And if you're thinking about test driven design or any other thing, it's, it's the same thing really. Only because you do test driven design, I think, uh, I, uh, I, I dare say, you will have to do other things too that are like in the names of the other methodologies, right? So you're doing test-driven design, you still want to be able to debug. You still have some domain that drives you potentially, etc. So it's not a single thing. Examples for debugging is uh, starting with uh, error. If you know what error costs a thing, you're already a good way along the way. Uh, so wiring all the error wires, having good error codes, having good error messages. That's really one of the basic things to do. Uh, I said clean style, uh, modularity, etc. And then using your tools. So for us at HSC, we have our own logging um, tool that helps us. We have our application template built. So we always start out from the same place. Meaning that when we start a new project, a Windows based project it is, uh, we have a repository template, we have an application template, so within one hour we can tell our CI machinery to build the application and run the EXE. It doesn't do anything, it pops up a splash screen, it shows a window, it has the debug uh, window, etc, etc. We start from that and then we start to fill in the modules and the, the functionality. Then that means from the very first second that I work on the project, I have like the error logging in place, for example, I have my log files, I have my whatever. So that, that is when I'm talking about debug driven. Design. Uh, we see custom probes here, DKMH API tester, Lumos, um, which is a real-time sequence viewer for DKMH, a very exciting new tool that the DKMH consortium is about to launch. So uh, I do hope that somebody sometime will have a chance to shoehorn it in and give a small presentation. So the start for me with the debug driven development stuff was the immediacy presentation I gave at NI Week way back then. And I did a lot of research into why LabVIEW is different from my brain than the many other text-based languages I programmed in. And for me, the thing that makes LabVIEW different is, is that immediacy. I want to go, open a VI, here's a number, press run, get another number out, ooh, that's wrong. Bop, bop, bop. You know, this is the style of programming I like to do, and this is what makes me a fast programmer. Um, so I've, I've written uh, blog articles about that um, on my my blog. Um, but essentially, I then started asking the question: Is that really okay? So that's what I'd like, but is it that thing that drives me? Um, so if you, so I've taken, I think the little step forward, forward, and you actually said it in your first slide, is that you don't want to go to a customer and be really scratching your head, so the debug. Well, actually, for me, personally, this is going back to my self-diagnosis, I absolutely don't care if you enjoy this. I don't care if, I, that's not how I work. My, you know, if I find something funny, it's funny. <laughs> I don't care if anyone else finds it funny. So personally, I don't, I'm not that worried about other people, except if they pay me money and I'm sat in front of a broken machine, then I really, really care about that. So for me, the reason to do this kind of thing is I'm most interested in being able to support someone. If a customer rings me up and says, it's broke, I want to go in and I don't want to look like an idiot going, oh, I don't understand how this works. I wrote this two years ago. Um, so no, I, I want to understand how it works. I want to understand how to fix it. And then usually my look at a problem, fix a problem cycle is 20 minutes, you know. And, um, and I'm happy with that. And everything I do is to push that down. Um, so, for all my bravado, I'm a scared little boy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I, I thought I'd just flow it out. And what's 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 the triggers? And um, Sam will quite like this, I think, because we were talking about refactoring. And 
We've got, so my company's gone to enormous unpaid extent. So we had contractors write software for us and they gave us the software and I looked at it and I, I said, I can't support this. I spent six months refactoring this software unpaid. And you think, well, what the hell drives you to put that unpaid effort in? And it's literally so I can go up and go, oh, I don't understand why that works. I'll just check it, I'll probe it, bot, fix it, go. So, and everything's a big feedback loop. Uh, we've talked about this in our workshops, but that's our process. It goes in, you get to the support point, and then if there's difficulties, that's your trigger to refactor, and then you bung that into your template so that the next project you've got, again, becomes easier to look after. And gradually you end up with a, an architecture that's nice and easy to look after. Um, yep, so why do that? Well, for me, I don't have any new customers this year or last year, um, but I've got lots of nice customers that like me and keep giving me work and more work. So it's good for business because that business is cheap. You know, I don't have to do well, my estimates now are uh, consider oh, how much money have you got? <laughs> we'll do this then. Whereas, you know, it used to be a week or two weeks. Um, yeah, so I've talked about that. I, I, I really hate not looking good in front of a customer. Um, not from a clothing perspective, uh, obviously. <laughs> I always look the same. <laughs> I buy three pairs of tracksuit bottoms in the, on the January sales at the start of the year and all my t-shirts from gigs. So that's, that's my clothing purchasing. Uh, anyway, it encourages user interaction as a first class process. That's one of the things I really like. Support is when you're sat with your customer. It's when your customer really wants you to be sat with. So let's have that as what we're doing. Um, correcting difficult to maintain software should result in improvements to design methodology, tools, and templates. So again, this is a nice feedback loop into your process. Uh, and it encourages a robust user feedback process, which again, is, is a very good thing to have in place. I think that's it. Push. Okay, how long we got? Two minutes. That's why we're nearly in, right? How do we make our software easy to support? Debugging is important. Uh, design for support is important. Support processes are important. Version control, we talked about this endlessly in our things. What are the disadvantages? Uh, it's an agile process, you know. It suffers from that lack of precision. No, accountants don't like that lack of precision. And they're the ones who give you money usually. Conclusions. First conclusion, I brought eight white dress shirts on this trip. So obviously I also like looking good in front of customers. Uh, not only with my dress shirts. So and I he does look say. good in front of customers. So that's, that doesn't take you to the end of the project. But the interesting thing is that Steve and I found out that actually we're probably talking mostly about the same thing when I say debug driven and he says support driven. And that only came through after we created these slides. So findings. And uh, I have two minutes, I think. So I'll do the, I'll switch to fab mode. Focusing on any coding write, code writing strategy will often include partly focusing on the others. In the end, all of them are just beats to the same end, write better code and make your life easier. Okay, now I'm choking. But the thing is that um, you, you probably won't pick one methodology and that's just it for you. And I alluded to that before. Uh, it's, a, it's a combination that will get you there. And again, do not think that focusing on any one lets you get away with the lack of good practice. That's not how it works. Which one should you use? Hmm. We thought about that a little bit. Stakeholder driven, what is your role? If you're like a hardcore developer, TDD is probably really a good fit for you. If you're a project manager, probably the risk factor is very interesting to you. And if you're the poor guy that needs to go to the customer and fix things, then the debug support thing probably might be the most helpful to you. Also, thinking about the phase of the project when you're starting out, you're writing the APIs, you're creating the tests. When you're further along, you do the debugging during the commissioning. And then, of course, when the customer picks up the phone and calls you that something's not working, uh, we want to look good and we do the support-driven thing. Team-driven, what, what is your way of working? The team size, it seems, doesn't <laughs> play so much into it. Uh, I've been dragged from a GDEFCON stage before, basically. Uh, so I'm not afraid of that. I'm running over one minute. Uh, should I use more than one? Yes, definitely. The more you use, the better. And uh, just think about the trade-offs. You need to combine all of them and find your own way of working. And that's it. Thank you very much.
A special thanks goes out to Kevin Chirey, Quentin Q. Aldridge, Mark Bala, and Jeff DeVore for their help in filming. And of course, this GDevCon NA 2023 wouldn't be possible without all of our sponsors. Thanks. I've just noticed about this projector, I like it. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> A little things.